angels waging war in the unseen realm. Global events fulfilling biblical prophecy, eternal life. What lies beyond mortality? From analyzing the paranormal from a biblical worldview to the discussion of cutting edge science and technology, conspiracy, discovery, special investigative reports, Unafraid to explore the challenging issues facing humanity. Welcome to another edition of Skywatch TV. We Christians say that we believe in an unseen God who spoke the universe into existence, rose again from the dead, and yet we tend to impose a naturalist view on what we read in the Bible. Welcome to Skywatch TV. I'm Derek Gilbert. Joining me in studio, the host of Skywatch Women, my wife and best friend, Sharon Gilbert. Hi, honey. And our guest, uh, who is a fascinating fellow, he's a scholar in residence at Logos Bible Software, the author of a number of books, um, I Dare You Not to Bore Me with the Bible, The Unseen Realm, Recovering the Supernatural Worldview of the Bible, and the host of the excellent Naked Bible podcast, Dr. Michael Heiser. My Thanks goodness. for having me. Nice Welcome to have back. you back again. Yeah, it's fun. <laughs> Specifically, want to talk about Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 through 4, which has been de-supernaturalized or demythologized de yeah. over the centuries. Uh, and this can lead to some really different interpretations about what God was telling Moses about that or what had been handed down to Moses mm -hmm. through um, the histories that he was familiar with. Um, for people who aren't familiar with the passages we're talking about, what do they describe and what do most Bible scholars or commentators, how, how do they view the passage? Yeah, there are lots of buckets uh, for this one that you could throw it in. Uh, for those who aren't familiar with the passage, this is the old sons of God, saw the daughters of men, you know, took them wives of all they, they wanted to and had children, because really odd offspring, the Nephilim, okay. Uh, you know, the men of renown, okay, the giants. So this has been one of the more vexing passages uh, for Old Testament scholars and just, you know, Bible readers for a long time. And scholars, you know, tend to throw it in a bunch of buckets. You know, there, there are those who would just say, okay, this is what it says. You know, we take it at face value, but it's pure mythology. You know, it has no relationship at all to reality. Uh, the, the, the Christian scholar, though, predominantly, though, goes down a different road. They can't really say, well, th here's something in the Bible that, you know, is just a bunch of hokum. Mm -hmm. uh, so they have to do something with it. And so the, the natural tendency is to demythologize it or strip it of its supernatural qualities. C can I ask you really quickly sure. to clarify when you say mythology? I think most people assume mythology means it's made up. You know, in, in the academic sense, myth is, as an academic ter term, just, you know, doing academic stuff, speaking academies now. Myth is a story in which some of the main characters are divine beings, they're not humans. So you could say, well, the Bible is full of mythic stuff. And it is because God's like the center stage actor mm -hmm. in, in, in so much of it. So you can use a term like mythic in that sense. Mm -hmm. And if you're in a room full of academics, well, they're going to kind of know what you mean. But if you're not, you start using words like mythic and mythological, mm -hmm. they're, they're, they're going to just make it sound like, okay, you mean it's a cartoon. Yeah. Okay. That sort of thing. So there, there's a difference there and it depends on the context and you know, what the person's thinking and what you're hearing and all that. But because of that, Christian scholars have tended to, again, want to normalize the passage. They want to just make it, oh, well, it, it seems to suggest this, again, this divine human transgression thing, okay? And you will find those themes in other literature, you know, mythic literature or mythological literature, and they'll say, well, we, it, it can't be that, okay, so it must be something else. And the something else is typically to take the sons of God and make them just normal people. And this is where the sons of Seth idea, the, so the, the, the dominant approach within evangelicalism is that what we have here are two lines, the, the line, the godly line of Seth, those are the sons of God. Mm -hmm. And the women in the story are the sons of Cain, the line of Cain. Well, the text never actually says that, but if you make it two lines, then they're both human and oh, well, that's the end of that problem. Of course, then you ha have to do something with the offspring. Mm -hmm. And so this is where we get the tendency to, to look at a term like Nephilim 
and kind of disregard the fact that every ancient translator, whether it was the Greeks producing the Septuagint in between the Testaments, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, mm -hmm. or later on you know, when the Old Testament is put into Aramaic, uh, all of those you know, traditions, at least the, the Greek traditions, would use gigantes, giant. And a lot of the Targums, again, are not fudging this either. A lot of the Aramaic translations, they're kind of uneven. Some do, some don't. But when you're talking about the Septuagint, which was the Bible of the early church, which was the Bible most of the time that the New Testament quotes when the apostles or Jesus quote the Old Testament, they're using the Septuagint. That's gigantes, okay, that's giants. And so you'd have to ask yourself the question, well, why did they look at this word and think that thought, mm -hmm. as opposed to, again, modern evangelicals will look at that word and say, oh, it means fallen ones, like warriors fallen mm -hmm. in battle. Well, the answer is because that helps you to normalize it. It helps you to take all the characters in the story and just make them normal people. There's nothing odd going on here, nothing supernatural going on here. You know, just keep walking, citizen. There's nothing <laughs> to see here. <laughs> it's just one of those things, you know, but, but there's this impulse. And I'm not saying it's sinister. I, I am saying it's incorrect for some really fundamental reasons. But it's not sinister because there, people who do this tend to think, well, I, I need to do this to protect the Bible, you know, against this mythological charge. And so they do it. That's an interesting viewpoint. Okay, God is incapable of making the Bible clear yeah. and consistent, so I'm going to help him out. Yeah, or it's, uh, the supernatural might scare people, so let's, let's, like, let's not make it too supernatural. You know, and, and you, what's so normal about the virgin birth, okay, to use your, your opening? You know, we're, we're Christians. We affirm the fact that there's a God. You know, you're Christian, is, you're Trinitarian, which means you have to affirm the incarnation, the virgin mm -hmm. birth. All the, what's so normal about that stuff? And when you really think about it, there's nothing normal about no. that stuff. Right, right. Well, a friend of ours, uh, Guy Malone, mm -hmm. made, it, made a really interesting observation once. He said, look, the price of admission to this club that we call Christians is believing that a Jewish carpenter literally rose from the dead. Yeah. And it's supposed to make more sense mm -hmm. from there. Yep. <laughs> yep. God passes through the birth canal. You know, <laughs> I mean, this is what you're saying. And Christians, well, of course we're saying that because that's, that's important. That's what we believe. But this, a passage like Genesis 6, you know, the first four verses becomes peripheral since it's not tied into, or at least people think, anything else. And it, it's tied into a lot, mm -hmm. actually. But even if you know that, well, it, it's not, there's no major doctrinal point here being made. So we can strip the supernatural out of this one and we're okay, and, and then it goes back to this, well, we kind of need to do this, because then the Bible you know, starts to have a, a relationship religiously to some other ideas. Well, it's like, hey, newsflash, people in the ancient world were not like us. They were not predisposed to not believe in the supernatural. Mm -hmm. Okay, they were predisposed to believe the supernatural, and if you as a Christian believe there's a God who actually interacts with people, did and does, then it's not so much of a leap. You know, what about, what about the cohabitation? And if you take the literal cohabitation view, well, it just says that divine beings could assume, take upon themselves human flesh, and flesh does what it does. They don't have to eat, but they do that. They wrestle with people. You know, they don't have to take bodies. They could just show up visually, but they don't. So again, the, they're very simple ideas that when you really think about them, it's like, well, yeah, that we would expect it a divine being, a God, a, you know, to be able to do something. Mm -hmm. And this doesn't seem like such a tall order as opposed to like creation. Mm -hmm. So what's the problem? And again, the problem is going back to this whole, I think, confusion of mythic and mythology and all that, because unbelievers love to, to throw rocks at the Bible for things like mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you believe in, in floating axe heads and uh, yeah. talking donkeys mm -hmm. and uh, giants who walked the earth uh, back in the day. When, but, when, I just okay. wanted to just stay on this just for a second. Since the original language doesn't mention the Cain line and the Seth line, how did that get started? Well, it gets started because of the, the assumption that Genesis 6, 1 through 4 is sort of building off Genesis 5, where you get genealogies and mm -hmm. other genealogies where you, you do have a line of Seth and a line of Cain in different mm -hmm. biblical genealogies and in different passages. And so I, I hate to put it this way, but this is, 
you know, this is kind of the scholarly truth here. Hey, we don't really know what to do with the first four verses. So they're about like intermarriage. So that must be genealogy talk. So we, we take it back to that again, that, that becomes mm. the justification, uh-huh. even though none of the wording is like the standard genealogies. No. You don't have any of that. Mm-hmm. You don't have the line of Cain specifically mentioned. And why is it that, that, that all the line of Cain are the bad guys? And why are they all women? I mean, you, you start asking questions like this, but mm-hmm. to me, even that's peripheral. I think the real issue is why didn't Peter and Jude take your view? Good one. Pastor, yeah. Yeah. why yeah. didn't yeah. they take your view? Because yeah. they don't. Well, you know, let's, let's explore that. Where, where do Peter and Jude um, draw f- the, the, their, their material from? Mm-hmm. Um, because it, uh, it seems to me that there's some things that they draw upon mm-hmm. talking about the, gi- or the uh, angels who were mm-hmm. punished for not keeping their first mm-hmm. estate yep. um, that, that is outside the Bible. Um, but I, I guess the bigger question is... It, it's why, out and why, in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and why did they do it? What was so important about interpreting these first four passages literally and taking uh, and incorporating that in the biblical narrative, the, mm-hmm. the intermarriage, the interbreeding of angels and humans. Yeah. I mean, Peter and Jude both draw on this episode in their talk about false teachers. And, and there's, there's a reason for that because associated with this event in intertestamental Jewish literature comes with it, the idea of false teaching that the watchers, again, to use the intertestamental, the Enochian language for the sons of God, were teaching things that, you know, were opposed to the truth that God wanted humans to have. And so there, there's a natural connection in the mind of the New Testament writer between, the, to use Peter's phrase, the angels that sinned mm-hmm. and false mm-hmm. teaching. Mm-hmm. So they become a, a, a convenient analogy uh, to address false teaching. But back to the, to the question about, well, what about these other sources? I mean, there, there are a couple of very clear indications that Peter telegraphs what he's thinking about in Jude the same way, the angels that sinned. Okay, angels who are kept in gloomy darkness in chains. Okay, these, these phrases. Uh, in, in the Greek text, one of the passages has you know, basically sent to Tartarus. Okay, you know, went, went to Hades, the chains of gloomy darkness. The, the, the Greek verb there was tartarao, which actually meant something to a Greek. It doesn't really mean anything to us because mm-hmm. we, don't, we don't translate it that way. But this tells you that they're thinking about not only something that our, their Old Testament, our Old Testament records this event, because there is no other angelic sin in the Old Testament. There just isn't. Mm-hmm. And people say, well, what about the third of the angels, you know, being swept down before creation? And guess what? There's no passage in the Bible that says that. The yeah. closest you get is Revelation 12. Mm-hmm. Which postdates right. Peter and yeah. Jude. And it's associated with the first coming of Jesus. Now that, the last time I checked history, that was after the creation. Yes. <laughs> yeah. You know, so th- there is no other candidate for this angelic sin. So Peter and Jude are, are just telling you point blank. This is what they're thinking. There's only one thing that they can be thinking of. In between the Testaments, though, you get a lot of, of Jewish writing interpretation of Genesis 6, 1 through 4. Now, I, I'm working on another book presently about what was, the, what was the original context for Genesis 6, 1 through 4. And that takes you back to Mesopotamia. And that material was known to the Jewish writers in between the Testaments, which is where they get it from. Hmm. So they're actually drawing on elements of an original thing that the, you know, the, the writer of Genesis was shooting at. They're aware of what that thing was. And that kind of leaks into their own writing. And, and by doing that, they preserve it. And then it, they use it in the New Testament because the, the whole idea of being imprisoned in darkness, you don't get that in Genesis 6, back in the Hebrew Bible. Right, right. You do get it in intertestamental period. And in the original story, the Mesopotamian story that, that Genesis is shooting at, you get it there too. Hmm. Now you get hints of it in passages like Ezekiel 32, where you have the Rephaim, again, the vestiges, the, 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 the descendants of the Nephilim through the Anakim are in Sheol, they're in the underworld. So you get hints of it there. But you don't get a verse that says, oh, and by the way, after this event, God was angry and he you know, sent them to Sheol. The under- you don't get a verse that says that, but you get them present in that place later on. So this extra tradition we think of as intertestamental, that doesn't count because it's not biblical. Well, it, it's actually very consistent with things you do get in the Old Testament in other passages about these descendants winding up in this place. It's actually very consistent across the board. 
Hmm. We're going to talk more about that, what uh, documents we might be able to read that shed some light on this, documents available to us today, how reliable they are, and how much weight we should give them as our conversation with Dr. Michael Heiser continues. We mentioned his book, The Unseen Realm, Reclaiming the Supernatural Worldview of the Bible. It is an important book for your reference library. We want to tell you how you can get it and get it at a special offer. Watch this. Finally, a book that helps you make sense of the hard to understand parts of the Bible. Skywatch TV is proud to offer The Unseen Realm by ancient language and Bible scholar, Dr. Michael S. Heiser. He takes you into the world of the men who wrote the Bible under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And by understanding their worldview, you will better understand some of the weird parts of the Bible. Like why was it so important to mention giants in the Old Testament? And why did Peter and Jude reference the angels who created them in the New Testament? The supernatural war between God and the fallen angels is real. The unseen realm helps you understand the way the apostles and prophets saw that war. And when you order the unseen realm from Skywatch TV, we will add these two books free. The Supernatural Worldview by Chris Putnam and G.H. Pember's classic, Earth's Earliest Ages. Order the unseen realm now by calling the number on your screen or log on to skywatchtvstore.com. Welcome back to Skywatch TV. We're interviewing Dr. Michael Heiser. Uh, the Unseen Realm is his uh, book that uh, we are recommending and will be the subject of a number of interviews, but some of them will be web exclusives to Skywatch TV. And I want to tell you about the programming that you don't see on network television. We record so much, we can't fit it all into the network schedule. We've got additional interviews with scholars like Dr. Heiser, but also additional programs such as Skywatch Women, hosted by Sharon Gilbert, our weekly program that we t discuss. Science Friday. Yes, discuss science. And of course, Into the Multiverse, a look at the very fabulous of reality itself, hosted by Josh Peck, author of Quantum Creation and Cherub and Chariots. You'll find all of those only at skywatchtv.com. Now, Mike, uh, intertestamental literature, um, things that was things that were part of the Jewish consciousness, Jewish theology, um, between the, the end of the Old Testament and the mm -hmm. opening of the book of Matthew. Uh, yeah. Why should we care? <laughs> yeah, how, it's not in our Bibles. Why should we care? Is that um, mm -hmm. to 21st century American yeah. Christianity? Why, well, why, why does it matter? Yeah, well, believe it or not, the people who wrote the Bible read things. Okay, they actually read. They were readers, <laughs> just like <laughs> you and I are. And when they read something, they sometimes found it useful. To, to talk about some other thing. And again, it, this is just what we do. Mm -hmm. I like to use the illustration, look, in a reformed context, a Calvinistic context, is, you know, you'd be trained in seminary, hey, go read John Calvin's commentary on Romans or read Calvin's Institutes mm -hmm. or something like that. Well, you're gonna find that valuable, again, within your tradition, when you go to interpret Romans or you go to interpret some other passage, you're gonna have Calvin in your head. And there's nothing wrong with that, Okay, I, I would suggest you, know, you, you need to work in the original text, but hey, he might say something that really captures a point very well. And you could bring that into the pulpit and it helps you communicate an idea in a sermon or a lesson or whatever. It's the same thing that with, with New Testament writers. They read a lot of material and a book like what we call Book of Enoch, First Enoch in, in academic parlance. That was widely read. You know, it, it shows up in the Dead Sea Scrolls. It's quoted in other material. People knew what that book was about mm -hmm. and similar books. And the New Testament writers, Peter and Jude are the best examples, but there are actually a number of other examples throughout the New Testament where you can tell, again, if you know what you're looking for and if, if you know the Enoch stuff well, you know that they're tracking on something here. They read that and they found it useful. It doesn't have to be inspired to be useful. It's just, well, okay, I got this floating around in my head and I want to talk about this point about the angels that sinned. And okay, I know just how to word this because this writer over here really said it well. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use that. That'll help me communicate. That's all that's going on in Peter and Jude. It's very normal for writers to do that. The ancient world had a lot more interaction between the various cultures than most of us realize. Mm -hmm. I, I've heard a scholar uh, describe it as... Um, yeah, specialists in, in, in ancient cultures tend to work inside like their own little cubby hole <laughs> and you'll get experts yeah. in ancient Egypt and ancient Assyria and ancient, uh, the ancient Hittites, but they don't really know what's going on in the other fields and you have right. to kind of stand back and look at it. Um, I was surprised to learn recently that uh, Tutankhamun actually had beadwork in his, you know, mummy uh, wrappings that came from Scandinavia and they've, they've proven this by 
chemically analyzing the stones. Um, how much of what the Mesopotamians were thinking, the Babylonians, the Akkadians, the, uh, the, the, the Canaanites, found its way into mm-hmm. what the ancient Jewish writers and Hebrew prophets were, were aware of? Yeah, in, in the literate class, the scribes, uh, you, would, you would have sort of direct contact with other literature because not only are you bringing trade goods, you know, consumables uh, with you from one place to the other and then exchanging, but they would all also bring texts. They would also bring, you know, you know physical material parts of books, mm-hmm. tablets, whatever, because you were keeping a library. You know, just again, what we sure. do today, it's not mm-hmm. any different than what, what was, what's happening today. And the scribes would store that away. If you were a literate person and could read that material, and in most of the biblical days, Akkadian was, was kind of like English is today. Everybody had to know Akkadian. It was the language of international mm-hmm. correspondence. So this is why the letters from the Pharaoh in Egypt during the Amarna period are written in Akkadian to oh, people in sure. Palestine. The diplomatic yeah. language. Sure. Right, it's okay. a diplomatic language. Well, it used to be French and now it's English. Right, yeah. right. So it, they had the same thing going on there. But if you were educated, well-educated, you would know a few of these languages because that was the tool of your trade. Again, you were a scribe. This is what you do. Now, informally, if you were not you know, literate, you would, you would hear uh, ideas passed on by the people you met. Okay, I, hey, I met this guy down by the shipyard and he's from, you know, Anatolia. And he was talking about this, his God, this or that, you know, deity did this or that. And, you know, you get in these conversations about the circumstances of life and how they looked at the world. And of course, for them, the world, you know, the supernatural interacts with what they're doing all the time, positive and negative. And so you hear about things. And so there's some cross fertilization in an informal way, too. I guess just to bring this home with just a, about five minutes left here, um, the, the understanding the ancient uh, uh, Jewish understanding or concept of the, the Nephilim, Anakim, Rephaim, uh, why is a supernatural understanding of that story necessary for mm-hmm. Christians? Uh, how does that impact the uh, concepts of sin and salvation? That, that's an excellent question. I mean, on, on, on one level, we've, we've talked about one element, and that is, look, if you want if you want to be able to say Peter and Jude were correct, in other words, I don't have to correct them, mm-hmm. okay, then you're going to go with what they say. So that, that's a fundamental issue for bibliology. But beyond that, we're trained as Christians to think uh, one way about kind of our circumstances, and sin you brought up very directly relates to this, whereas an ancient person thought a little bit differently about it. Here, here's, here's what I mean. If you walked up to the average Christian today and said, hey, why is the world the way it is? You know, why, you know, why do we have human depravity? You know, wh- what happened, you know, if, if the creation story, you know, everybody was kind of had a relationship with God and it just went terribly wrong so fast. How did that happen? Well, the average Christian would say, oh, that's the fall. It's Genesis 3. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, a second temple Jew, a Jew, again, living in Jesus' time, would not say that. Second Temple Jew would say, well, there's basically three reasons. <laughs> there's not just one, there's three. One is the fall. The other, you know, when we know that we, sin enters the world there, we have the first rebellion, humans rebel, the divine rebellion, that's where it all gets started. But then we have Genesis 6, 1 through 4. And because of what happened there, we have, remember Genesis 6, 5, mm-hmm. the wickedness of man was great on the earth. Well, yeah. There's a whole set of ideas, again, within, in the period of Jesus' day that blames the watchers, blames the sons of God who violated God's you know, boundary rule here between heaven and earth and taught humanity all sorts of things that corrupted them. Hmm. So a, a first century Jew would be thinking, that's part of why the world is as bad as it is because of what happened there because we, we had another divine rebellion and it made us even more, more wicked. It, they manipulated us. And then the third is the, the Babel event. This is you know, going back to the concept mm-hmm. of cosmic geography, when God punishes the nations by assigning them to the sons of God and the other sons of God become corrupt. So a, a first century Jew would say, we're just messed up, not just for one reason, but for all three of these things. And what the church has done ah. is the church has has defaced, really eviscerated Genesis 6. So that is out of the picture. Mm. And you never really learn about what 
you never really learn about Deuteronomy 32, 8, and 9 when it comes to Babel. You just learn the story. Mm -hmm. But the supernatural element of that is taken away too. Right. So the big answer is there's three events in the Old Testament that amount to divine acts of rebellion and human acts of rebellion and the fallout, pardon the pun, of all three are why humanity is just in such a mess. And when the Messiah comes, here's, what, here's, here's why it's a big part of, of this that's really missed. They believe that when the Messiah would come, he would reverse all these things, not just Genesis 3. Okay, Jesus is, of course, the answer to the problem of death. Okay, Genesis mm -hmm. 3, okay, resurrection. But he's also the answer to the infection of, of humanity by evil, by these other divine rebellions. And there are things in the Gospels, in the book of Acts, in the epistles, that draw on this idea of messianic reversal of these other two things too, that we never get to in our theology. So if you want to have a fuller understanding of who you are, what, what the mess you're in is, and what Jesus was about, you need this other stuff. Hmm. And that's a perfect setup because you're working on a uh, book dealing with that concept yeah. of this uh, supernatural reversal right. of what, yeah, the ancient uh, uh, the, the, the whole, yeah, sons the whole of importance God. of that uh -huh. for New Testament theology. You never get there. Well, we will have you back when that book comes out because that's going to be another fascinating set of discussions. Um, just w within, say, uh, with just a minute to go, uh, again, um, where should people start if they want to get a better, deeper understanding of the importance of the Genesis 6 event? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Yeah, I, I would say, I mean, you know, the, the cheesy answer is read my book. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the unseen realm. But, but to be honest, with that, that's why I wrote it. Mm -hmm. Because I'm, I'm trying to take, again, the academic discussion and make it decipherable to just the, the normal person who's interested, the person outside the guild. Because there's just a lot of material that you never hear about in church or Bible study or whatever. And, and when you do hear about it, it's often sort of caricatured, you know, in, in, in some other source. So that's why the book exists. And I would say if you have a good amount of Bible under your belt, you know, you're not a new Christian, that's a really good place to start. Because I devote five chapters to Genesis 6 and then Nephilim descendants and all that stuff in mm. that book. Fascinating stuff, and it uh, will open your eyes to reading the Bible in a way that you probably have not done before. The Unseen Realm, Recovering the Supernatural Worldview of the Bible. Dr. Michael Heiser, thank you, Mike. Yep, thanks we'll for We'll continue having our conversation next week on Skywatch TV. Look us up on Facebook. We appreciate uh, you taking the time to watch as we keep watch. For Sharon Gilbert, I'm Derek Gilbert, and this is Skywatch TV.